and right. and and so also really important to look at if you're looking at birth weight for example you'll see underneath the EBVs um, there's a thing there where we've got traits recorded so if birth weight has been one of those traits recorded you and, and it's in a reasonable size contemporary group um, you should be fairly confident that that's accurate data I'm glad you mentioned that. So accuracy with all the EBVs or estimated breed values that feature in these tables, there is an accuracy rating given as a percentage. And that obviously is, is worth scrutinising. That's right. And, and that trait's recorded. And there's a few other things like in late, latter years, genomics has come in to really make a big difference to that, to that uh, accuracy. And, and probably, and def, as I say again, the, the big thing with accuracy is make sure that that actual trait's been recorded. Because that trait comes from the actual animal's weight, but it also comes from his parents' weight. So if you've gone two or three generations where that trait hasn't been recorded and it's just been ex extrapolated out of the pedigree information, um, there's probably not going to be a whole lot of accuracy there. I know, so that's important. So then if we focus for a moment then on calving ease, because uh, for a lot of our clients, that, that is an important trait. And of course, growth and carcass characteristics are very important. And, of, and I'm a big fan of having uh, docile animals, if, you know, if, especially if you're a weekend operator, you don't want to have fizzy cattle. But if we focus on calving ease for starters, if we then have a look at those traits in there, there are a number of them. Uh, there's, there's calving ease direct, calving ease of daughters, gestation length and birth weight. They're grouped together as the calving ease indicators. Uh, what would you like to say about any of those? Yeah, well, they're all important and probably again back to the, to work out what breed average is. And, and for most herds, Jim, better than breed average in this area will, will be a herd improver for that trait, there you not go. just birth weight. And to make it easy with these EBVs as they're published, there will be a measure of the, of the, uh, of the breed average yes. for these traits on the table. So you can assess it for yourself there. Um, one thing I, I might point out, because people who are uh, new at this get a little bit confused, the gestation length EBV is one of, the, the, one of only a couple that you're actually looking for a negative score. So gestation length is the length of pregnancy. The longer a pregnancy is, the more likelihood is you're going to have a big calf pop out at the end of it. And so you actually, in, in this particular EBV, a negative value is actually a helpful thing if you're looking for animals that are going to um, calve easily. And, and, and that's a really good point because not all the traits measured there bigger is always better. That's right. And, and even the growth traits, if you've got a bit of a hill block, Jim, and you know you haven't put much fertiliser on for whatever reason, and and you think that animal might be nutritionally stressed, you don't want them in the top 10% for growth either, because you'll never fatten them. So, in all the traits, bigger is not always better. That's right, and I think that people also will, uh, often mention the mature cow weight is another one of those that you want to be a little bit careful of. It's all very well to select an animal that's going to produce enormous cows for you, but an enormous cow needs an enormous amount of feed. If she's going to produce a lot of milk, and so if you haven't got a block that's going to suit her, that's not exactly the sort of trait you want to aim for. Um, now, of these other um, calving ease traits, so uh, calving ease direct, what is that a measure of? Well, it's, it's a, the direct calving ease of that, that mating, basically. So that, that's a measure then that if, if this bull that you buy were joined to a batch of two-year-old heifers, how easy it's going to be for them to calve. That's that one. Uh, so that, of course, is important. Then you've got also calving ease of the daughters. Yep, so that, that'll be, you know, if you carve out two-year-old heifers or two-and-a-half, three-year-old heifers, that'll be an indication of how they'll actually go on and carve themselves. Yeah. So that's the performance of that bull's daughters. Uh, and then uh, birth weight, uh, we've discussed already, but that's the likelihood of what sort of size calf he's going to throw compared to the breed average. That's right. And, right. and, and just with birth weight, too, you need to be mindful you don't get too focused on a number, Jim. So really, if you go um, from a bull that's two for birth weight, which is in the top 25% of the breed probably, if you go to three and you go to top 30% of the breed, there's not really a lot of difference when you put the bull and the cow effect. So don't get too focused on we've got to be way down there, when as long as you're picking below breed average for those traits, you're probably looking pretty good. The other thing we should mention about estimated breed values is that the bull only contributes 50% 
yes. of, of the genetics uh, for, the, for the calf. 50% comes from the cow. So you need to be wary of that when you're looking at these things as well. The calf is not going to be an exact replica of the bull. Uh, it, it's half-half. Half of the genetics comes from the mother. Now, uh, what we're going to do is have a look at um, a, a couple of examples you've pulled out, lots 10 and lots 44, uh, because uh, to look at, you know, they're both wonderful looking bulls. And if you turned up at the auction and, and bid on those two, you would be doing yourself a disservice, perhaps, according to the EBVs, if you had selected uh, lot number 10, who's an impressive looking fellow. He's actually bigger than his mate, even though he's a couple of months younger. Uh, so obviously his potential for growth is fantastic, but if you look at his carving ease traits, he, he doesn't match. He, he's, he's not the sort of bull you're going to want in comparison to lot 44 if you're going to put him over heifers. And that's exactly right. And so I suppose in this case, uh, you know, we've done the homework at home, Jim, we've looked at the data and we've shortlisted a few bulls that might suit us. And so that's when you go to the sale. Uh, or, or it may not be a sale, it might, you might be looking at, at a private inspection, you might be going some person, they might have bulls for sale privately, you don't have to buy them out of an auction, you can buy them privately right. out of the paddock, but <clears throat> you do your work at home, your work at home. you look at the, the data that's been supplied, um, and then that's when you go to, the, go to the physical part of the selection process, and that's the time when you actually should look at the bull. So at home you've shortlisted your group of bulls, and, and I probably should have mentioned before too that you probably need to have an A and a B list. Mm. Don't go to a, looking if you've got 10 bulls in the yard, don't think, well, and especially in an auction situation, don't get caught in the trap with saying, that's the bull I've got to have. That's so right. you work out your budget, you do your financial planning and say, okay, well, that's the best bull to suit my needs, but maybe he's going to be too expensive or the bloke who's selling him to you wants a bit more for him and not as much for the others. So that's when you pick out your plan B and plan C options that's right. and, and you price accordingly. That's right. And that actually, that was a good point you raised earlier, Ted, uh, is that you know, auctions are, are a high pressure environment, uh, there are people bidding online, all sorts of things going on. Don't be afraid to actually, uh, I mean, the, these um, auction catalogues come out well before the sale so that uh, informed buyers can do their homework. The, the, the owners of these studs are very happy for you to get in contact and seek their advice about, I'm looking for this kind of bull, this is the kind of country I've got, or these are the type of animals I'm joining. What do you recommend from your suite of bulls? Can you give me a bit of an idea? And it might be as much as things change on the day, they might also have a bit of an idea of likely price according and, to just what sort and, of genetics and, are in some of these bulls. And, and certainly, you know, buying your bulls should be a three-step thing. So you look at the paperwork, and then if you can, especially in an auction situation where, like you said, there's high pressure and a lot happening, we really recommend all our clients come and actually look at the bulls physically before auction day. We think that's really important. There you go. Uh, um, and then, and then on auction day, you turn up and say you've shortlisted. You know, if you're looking for a particular date, in the case talking about today, it's birth weight. So you know, in, in in our case this year, we had 40 bulls, 48 bulls out of the 70 that that we thought were heifer orientated quite their, their their pedigree and their actual data and the physical shape of the bull lending them to be heifer bulls. So you pretty much you can tick you can cross all the others off and so you just come and look at those 48 and that's when you actually need to look at the animal and, and you need to start to look at his, his phenotype. And I, I should have actually mentioned that because you can take advantage of uh, the sale catalogue in a lot of cases where the owners will have given you a summary of what they see as his most important traits. You know, right. If someone's looking for a heifer bull or if someone's looking for a bull that's going to turn off steers, they're going to grow at a rate of knots, yeah. you know, it'll be listed, uh, usually in the sale catalogue in the summary. Now, um, so as far as the, the other part of the homework that should uh, be, be part of the process here, so we've got the estimated breed values, the EBVs. Another part of the process when, you know, before these bulls even come to auction should be that they've had a soundness examination. It, it's generally called uh, a, a breeding bull, I beg your pardon, a bull breeding um, soundness examination. Uh, there are veterinarians and other parties that do that around the state uh, and, and that's aimed at uh, checking the, the conformation of the animal and his semen qualities. But I'll let Ted elaborate on that. Yeah, yeah. So in, in our case we get a vet to come in and, and do their semen test them and, and strict a few of the physical things like 
scrotal size and we also get a guy that independently looks at structure for us too. Um, so yeah, so we do a bit of that and that's all really important. The actual, you know, the EBVs are great. We, we have a, a lot of faith in, in the accuracy, especially in the Angus breed that we're in, of the accuracy of the traits that we record. But we also supply physical raw data with those bulls too, like weight, just basic things like weight, straddle size. Um, Seam and yeah, result yeah, evaluation. Seam evaluation. So that, that's, a, that's an important point because no matter how fantastic the genetics of the bull are and no matter how impressive an animal he might be to look at, if that bull has got poor quality semen or if he's got a deviated penis or something like that that's going to prevent him from getting calves, it, it's his meat value only essentially. So that's something that buyers actually really want to take notice of, that the animal has been assessed for general soundness. Um, some of the points in that soundness uh, evaluation uh, in terms of confirmation tend to be uh, how upright they appear to be in the legs, uh, particularly in the hind legs, because there's a, there's a feeling that, uh, well not a feeling, the observation is that fellows that are too upright in the end are prone to injury uh, and wear and tear, that sort of thing and even uh, that they might damage their penis if, if... Keeping their own heifers selling steers and grass-fed steers. And so they're very similar, but they're vastly different bulls. Um, and I think uh, you'll have some videos playing there of those bulls in this webinar. And, and if you look at the Lot 44 bull, he is uh, quite a bit more compact bull. He's not as heavy in the bone. He's got a nice set on his hock. He moves along really well, but just not as big an animal and you look at his data you know he's in the top sort of 25 I think off memory percent of all his calving ease and, and, and actual birth weight data and, and then you go to the lot 10 bull and, and he's similar again similar numbers on the Angus breeding index but vastly different makeup of his data and, and you actually look at the bull he's a lot bigger longer bull his bone structure is a lot bigger um, if I found him in the heifers gym I'd be pretty nervous but he has got a lot of magnificent attributes but Low birth is not one of them. So in summary, they have a similar overall Angus breeding index, but one bull, lot number 44, uh, a, a lot of the value that he represents is because of his calving That's ease right. parameters, whereas uh, lot 10 has a, has a similar breeding index, but a lot of uh, his value is in his, the growth rates of his progeny. Yeah. Right, now, um, the, the, on sale day, or before sale day, if people are coming to assess a bull, now they should have basic information in front of them. They should have looked at these EBVs. They should have that short list. They should have satisfied themselves that there's been a, a soundness examination has been done so that the bull is not firing blanks and that's, uh, so that there is some character that, that's really going to rule him out, uh, like a deviated penis or something like that. Uh, so let's presume that's, that's all well and good. And if there's, I can just butt in, Jim, yeah. also in, on that mode, check what what herd health needles had too, you know, where they sit with their current 71 or 5 and 1, you know, when did they have their last noodle, especially in the next few months, it's going to be crucial here, I imagine, because, you know, I think we're going to get an early spring, so, you know, yeah, pulpy kidney and things like that, you know, they can, they can be vaccinated with 7 in 1, so they might have been right now for some of those other glossodial diseases, but maybe if you take him home and you put him in a paddock that's fairly lively and a lot of clover content, you know, you might be want to be concerned about pulpy kidney. So, you know, I'd stress strongly in the next few months, anyone bringing their bull home, I'd be giving them another shot of, you know, a seven in one, just to cover yourself on that one. Right, well, we've, uh, we've mentioned clostridial vaccinations. That's your five in one and seven in one. Uh, in order to prevent the animal dropping dead from enterotoxemia or, or blackleg, what other animal health information do you think uh, that a buyer should be seeking from, from the seller where bulls are concerned? Uh, um, certainly vibriosis, Jim. So, you know, you need to just check that they've been done for vibrio because, as you know, that's quite an issue in this area of, of our landscape. And probably another big thing that we see, and we go to a fair bit of trouble and time to vaccinate our, bull, vaccinate our bulls for three-day sickness. So make sure if they've been done for three-day that they get their annual booster because there's nothing mm. more disappointing for us than that we do that, go to that trouble to do that vaccination and then people don't give them their annual booster when they get him home. And, and, then, and then they get Easy sick comes. and they lose a bull. And we hear that story a fair bit, more than you think actually. People don't give them that annual booster. So those two diseases we've just mentioned there. So vibriosis is a venereal disease. It causes infertility. The bull is the carrier. 
You don't want your bull to get infected because it can be hard to clear the infection from him and you may never succeed. The second disease that was mentioned there is three-day sickness. Now that's a, a viral disease that's carried by mosquitoes and possibly midges. Uh, we get it most years here, but not every year. So often uh, Queensland, it, it's, it's endemic there for a lot of the year and it, it seems to make its way down the coast with the insects during summer. And it arrives in the hunter usually in late summer uh, early autumn. Occasionally we'll have it flare up, but apparently can overwinter in the hunter. It might flare up before Christmas. Uh, because of the area we're in, I'm going to mention tyleriosis as well. Uh, tyleriosis is a protozoal disease carried by the common tick and uh, it has laid bulls low and, and all sorts of other animals. Bull, uh, animals born, cattle born in, in these coastal districts actually tend to have been exposed. These are called endemic areas. They get exposed when they're young and by the time they get to saleable age, uh, I'd expect that all these bulls would have been exposed and be immune. Uh, if you go further west and buy a bull, you can't expect that that bull arrives with any immunity because they, it's not endemic in areas further inland. Uh, from our experience, and we've brought a few bulls outside the district, there's no doubt it's an issue, but our best advice there is um, keep a good eye on them, no stress in that first two month period. Go. So a little bit of hand feeding, don't expect them to do too much in that first two month period. Um, uh, you, and you probably do need them, want, you want them exposed at some point in time, yeah. but not to the extent that they actually get sick. Um, and so, yeah, it's a tough one, tile area, because there's no treatment. But yeah, all I can say there is, is if you buy bull, by all means, buy bull outside the area, and there's great genetics all over Australia that, that we should be able to access, but tile area is an is a, is a issue when you do that. Um, our best advice is, you need to be prepared to get them on site, keep the ticks off them, and not do too much with them for two months. Now, um, we'll come back to the, the train. We've, we've had a look at uh, our bull. We've, we've uh, done our homework. We've spoken to the, the principals of the stud, got some information. We've made a short list. We've eyeballed the bulls ourselves. The paperwork's all in place. We're happy with, we like the look of certain bulls, all that sort of thing. Uh, now we get to the auction. Yeah, and, so. and, the, and the auction is a, is a tough one. It is a tough one too, Jim, because you know it's a, if if you're in an auction situation, uh, because it usually it's it's a high pressure situation. You're spending a significant amount of money, so that's where your pre planning is really important. Is is knowing what bulls you really like and and having a, a, a plans A, B, and C so that you can move through that and and you do a, a bit of financial planning with it and work out well how much you actually can afford to spend on your best bull, setting a limit, going to the limit, being fairly rigorous with that, and then then actually picking your plan B bull and setting a budget on him and then you move on. Um, and just, yeah, don't get caught up in the situation of the auction. Um, uh, it's just, it, it, you just need to plan and, and be confident that if you do your homework and, and you have a good idea of your parameters and what you're looking for, it doesn't have to be a stretch, stressful day. There we go. So preparation is everything. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've bought our bull uh, and uh, we expect him to have arranged delivery. It's going to occur on a certain day. What do you, what do you advise people? So you, you're bringing a bull onto a place uh, not ne and the bull may not necessarily have come from this district, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, what sort of advice do you give your buyers? So, so really important that we feel is that when the bull is delivered onto your farm, is that you have some animals in the yard. So as soon as he walks off the truck, you've got a cow or a couple of cows or something that he can walk straight into. Because, you know, for that bull, he's been pulled out of his peers and chucked on a truck and then maybe two, three, sometimes five or six hours on a truck. Pretty stressful experience. So when they get off the truck, have your yards ready, have a couple of animals in there. And then we'd like to think, not necessarily shut them in the yard, with those animals, but if you've got a little paddock, you can let them mm. out in. So he hasn't become lame during transport, that kind of thing. If he needs a further veterinary assessment, if you've been unlucky enough that that happens, that's worth doing. Uh, and there are also a few procedures that we normally recommend to people. If you've got him in a, in a contained area, like a small paddock adjacent to the yards, one thing is we've had a bit of problem with all the hay that's been fed out that's come from all parts of Australia during the drought and some nasty weeds have sprung up. If you have that fellow confined there for the first three or four days, 
the weed seeds that are in his system are going to come mm -hmm. through and at least you're going to be able to control any weeds that come through him. So his soundness, um, he's going to tell you something. I hate to mention it, Ted, because of course no bull would ever do this, but it might give you an idea too, if he's trying to break out of there immediately and break fences, if you bought yourself a rogue, you may as well be aware of from the word go. Yeah. Uh, as far as uh, that fellow, this is where we spoke about earlier about vaccinations and things. If You're not going to hurt him, even if theoretically he's, he's already covered by five in one or seven in one. You will not hurt him, uh, as long as your technique is, is, is all right, uh, if you give him another vaccination. To me it makes sense uh, because you don't want him falling over dead with something that's completely preventable. Uh, and as, I, as we mentioned earlier, I think a drench is probably a wise precaution. Because we mentioned Tyleria, and although I earlier said that I prefer oral, oral drenches for worms, uh, I've got to admit that I do like a pour on as part of the protocol when they arrive, just, just to slow the, the, especially if you're buying in those high risk months like spring, just the, the quantity of, of ticks otherwise that are going to be on that fellow from the word go if you're unlucky. Um, that, that's part of the protocol. Uh, is there anything else you well, can probably, think of there? You probably you need to get an NVD, Jim, and that's more your expertise. And yeah. maybe you need to just check on who actually transfer them off your database, the, the bull breeder's database onto the owner's database. You know, in most cases, in an auction situation, it's uh, agents. But if you're just buying out of the paddock, well, that's certainly not the case if there's no agent involved. So some party has to do that. Fantastic yeah. point. So the bull should come to you with an NVD. There has to be some paperwork or it's illegal to move him. And according to the terms of your, your compulsory farm, farm biosecurity plan, you should be seeking a, an NVD, a national vendor declaration, for any cattle, any livestock, in fact, that come onto your property. As far as the, uh, the NLIS database, the bull must come with an NLIS ear tag in his ear, the details of which is the responsibility of the buyer to transfer on the database. Now, it may be that that will be done for you by, by the vendor, uh, you know, if an agent's involved, but that's something you need to sort out because ultimately it's your responsibility. Uh, the other thing that probably I should mention because we've seen so many deaths with nitrate poisoning, uh, where people are feeding hay, is that if, if an animal comes to you hungry, and let's say he's a bull that's genuinely been just paddock fed, and he hasn't, he's not used to uh, feeds that actually have a high nitrate content, diabolical thing to actually then sling him a, a, a big bale of something fantastic and you kill him with it. So nitrates, uh, you know, the, the, work, the haze that are most uh, often responsible for it would be oats and sorghum followed by millet. Just be wary of it. Uh, for, for feeding that animal, if you've got a small paddock you can graze in, that's, that's ideal. Pasture is going to be safer, uh, mild pasture like that. But if you're going to feed them hay, it's a good thing to have some moderate quality hay that you can fill him up on, because that'll be the final bit of advice is then before you turn him right out, you don't want... Self-respecting bull breeder should take the line that once they've sold, they wash their hands. It's certainly, you know, that we still have a strong interest in the welfare of all our bulls we sell and any animals we sell. So we like to think, we like to hear the good stories too, don't we? But we also think it's really in, uh, really important that, that we hear where you can really drive your profitability if you, do, if you make the right decisions. Um, and, and so it's worth spending the time on to do it, do it right. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much again, Ted. Cheers. Good Thanks for you. coming along. Thank you. Thanks, Jim and Ted. I'm sure that everyone will have found that extremely interesting and useful and will now be assessing more thoroughly any future bulls they may wish to purchase. Next up, we have District Vet Kylie Greentree discussing goat health and decision making. Kylie grew up in the Lower Hunter. After graduating from vet school, she worked in mixed practice for eight years in Inverell on the north coast of New South Wales in the hinterlands of Queensland. Kylie then spent four years in Burke working as a regional animal health leader for the DPI as a field veterinarian. She has now done 10 years as a district vet for the LHPA and LLS in the Lower Hunter. In 2017, she completed her memberships in goat medicine with the Australian New Zealand College of Veterinary Scientists. She is one of only three people in Australia to hold this much esteemed qualification. Thanks, Kylie. Hello, my name's Kylie Greentree, District Vet based at Maitland. I um, 
I have a particular interest in goat medicine. And today I'm going to give you a brief overview of farming goats and common diseases that you might see. There are many breeds of goats with different purposes. So my discussion today is very general. So feel free to contact me after this presentation and um, you may also want to become a part of my goat group where I send out a monthly newsletter and inform you of any workshops that are coming up. So going into goats, you need to have an end goal in mind. Are you just having a few pet goats? Then you don't need to worry about markets, but you do this the lifestyle that you want. You need to make sure you keep very good records when you're going into farming and strict farm buyer security. You want to protect your stock against pests, weeds and diseases. Do you have the skills required uh, or what skills do you need to develop before going into goats? Setting a breeding objective. The more traits you pick, the, longer, the slower the rate of progression. So you want to select for the most important traits. These traits that people will select for include growth rates, good body conformation, frame size, carcass and meat quality, fertility, ease of kidding, temperament, motherability, fiber characteristics, milk production, physical characteristics such as skin color. You also need to set a time frame in order to measure these objectives and make sure you are progressing in the right direction. A lot of people will buy goats for weed control, which is, which is a great idea. Goats are browsers and they do prefer to eat weeds over pasture. So they do tend to work well. They will um, eat the seeds and prevent dispersion of, of those seeds. They'll ring bark and structurally weaken shrub species. The advantage is it will save on chemicals, on uh, labor and machinery. So you need to know what weeds are on your property uh, and their palatability. So the palat palatability of the weeds will vary throughout the, the growth stages of that plant. You can monitor the availability of those low palatable weeds and if the goats are starting to eat those low palatable weeds then obviously the stocking rate needs to be reduced or they need to be moved to a different area. Meat and Livestock Australia have an excellent article called Weed Control Using Goats, which has a detailed list of plant species and their palatability and toxicity. There's also another article called The Palatability and Potential Toxicity of Australian Weeds to Goats by Simmons, Holst and Burke, which I'll have a link at the end of the presentation. You must ensure there's also sufficient pasture to satisfy the nu nutritional requirements of goats. You need to ensure good fencing, watering points and yards. If you plan to use chemical sprays and grazing, then you need to ensure that you have weighted the withholding period of that chemical and the directions will be on the label. Be aware of certain plants and toxicities. Toxicities include nitrates, oxalates, photosensitization, such plants as rhododendrons and azaleas can cause vomiting, bloat and death. Body condition scoring is really important. The body condition score will vary from a one to five. In my pictures in this PowerPoint, you can see I've got a vision of them from the rear view and the side view. One being emaciated and five being obese. So you want to have your goats at a score of three in order to prevent other health issues. So when you're measuring the body condition score, you're measuring across the, um, the short ribs, which I'll, oh, which I'll point to just up here, across the spine, across the long ribs, and in a dairy goat, you also will feel the sternum and feel for fat deposits across the sternum. It's also important to know what is normal in a goat body conformation, 
behaviour, they're a herd animal and they're a browser, so they prefer to eat with their heads up. Puberty in males is from three to six months of age and from females six to 12 months of age when they're about 40% of their mature body growth. Their gestation period is 150 days and they are seasonal breeders. So they will come into estrus as the day length starts to decrease. The frequency of estrus is every 21 days and that estrus period will last 24 to 36 hours. Their normal heart rate is 60 to 80 beats per minute. Their respiratory rate is 12 to 30 reps per minute. And their normal temperature is 39.5, roughly plus or minus 0.5 of a degree. So they run a little bit hotter than other animals. Industry obligations. The Biosecurity Act is a piece of legislation that manages biosecurity risk in Australia. It's about managing disease and pests that may cause harm to humans, animals, plants, health and the environment. Livestock health and disease management. Everyone who works with or owns animals has a duty of care to take reasonable measures to protect the health and welfare of those animals. Animal welfare. Goat animal welfare standards and guidelines were developed by Animal Health Australia and the Goat Industry Council of Australia. The industry standards and guidelines apply to all those responsible for the care and management of goats. When you are selling and moving goats, they require an NLIS ear tag, which you can see in the picture. Uh, NLAS stands for National Livestock Identification Scheme and it's Australia's scheme for identification and tracing of livestock and is crucial in protecting and enhancing Australia's reputation as a producer of quality meat. Australia exports to over 100 markets, export markets and we are the world's largest exporter of goat meat. NLIS allows Australia ongoing access to these markets. It also gives us the ability to respond quickly with major food safety or disease incidents. A national vendor declaration is a movement document that must accompany all livestock that, are, that move. Goats entering and moving within New South Wales must have a national vendor declaration or a transported stock statement. A national goat health statement is available on the Farm Biosecurity website. It has a list of questions and it provides a, um, a seller of goats this, um, the ability to offer information about the biosecurity and disease risk of the animal that that, that, that person is purchasing. The buyer can check and compare the health statements and ensure that the goat that they're planning on buying is not going to provide a risk to their stock. What are the common diseases in your area? It's important to develop a relationship with your private practitioner and your district veterinarian in the area and have a discussion about the common diseases that you will come across in goats. It's also important to develop a farm biosecurity plan for your property. Common diseases happen commonly and um, there are, what are the common causes of death with your, with your goats? Uh, many diseases are brought onto your property, so it's important to quarantine any new introductions onto your property. You want to ensure you're not going to bring in resistant worms onto your property or other, other common diseases, uh, you, such as uh, caprine, arthritis, encephalitis, Yoni's disease, foot rot, and I'll talk briefly about those soon. A new, an, new introduction should be quarantined if possible for a few weeks. They need to be drenched with a quarantine drench, which is normally three to four different families of actives, of drenches, and a vaccination for clostridial diseases. You want to ensure, um, like find out about predators in the area, wild dogs and foxes cause issues with, with goats quite often. Chills and weather extremes. Uh, goats are quite susceptible to weather extremes. Uh, so you need to, um, to provide shelter for them. Worms are a big issue and, um, 
and we'll talk about worms in a second. And I can talk. I could talk about worms for over an hour. You know, it's a it's a massive issue here in the Hunter. Clostridial diseases. Goats are very susceptible to pulpy kidney or enterotoxemia. Foot issues such as foot rot, and um, and there's many other diseases. So, um, but I'm only touching on a few briefly. Worms. Common worms in the Hunter region include barber's pole worm, brown stomach worm, black scour worm, then there's tapeworms and a, and a few others. But barber's pole worm is probably our number one uh, killer of goats in the Hunter. Our weather conditions are ideal for the development of, worm, of the worm life cycle. We have high rainfall, humidity, uh, generally high stocking rates, set stocking, poor nutrition, short pastures and the inability to rest paddocks. The most susceptible age group are the weaners and the does that are about to kid. Clinical signs with worms include ill thrift, weight loss, bottle jaw, pale conjunctiva or the uh, third eyelid, scours and death. Management of worms is is not just about drenching and we prefer to use as little drench as possible because there is a lot of resistance to the drenches out there. So we need to incorporate strategic integrated management practices. Uh, these include cross grazing with other species, uh, grazing pastures greater than 10 centimetres in height to limit the access to larvae, the, the worm larvae, Increase the amount of browse for goats, spelling paddocks, grazing weaners on low risk paddocks, regular faecal egg counts for marcher scoring, selective drenching, nutritional management and culling those animals that are causing your biggest issues. 20% of your, of your stock are causing 80% of your problems and contaminating your paddocks. Need to discuss drench dose rates and withholding periods with a veterinarian as goats will metabolise drenches a lot faster than sheep. So you may require a different dose rate, but that would be under a prescription with a veterinarian. Wormboss is a, uh, an excellent tool. I have a link at the end of the presentation that will um, that is, is really worthwhile going on and you can pop in your information about your property and it will suggest different control strategies and integrated management practices that, that you could use on your property. Clostridial diseases. Clostridial bacteria are spore forming anaerobic organisms that survive in the environment for many years. Many clostridial disease, main clostridial diseases of concern in goats are tetanus and enterotoxemia, which is also called pulpy kidney. Tetanus, uh, the bottom picture is a picture of a goat with tetanus. It, you can see the clinical signs, the stiff limbs, uh, tail um, is upright, they normally drool. Sometimes they'll have pricked ears, not with these long-eared goats, but um, prolapsed third eyelid and the paralysis and death. Normally goats are highly susceptible to pulpy kidney and they often um, occurs due to dietary changes and consequently reg more regular vaccinations are required with goats. If you're in a liver fluke area then black disease can develop and if you have fighting bucks then malignant edema or big head can also develop, which is a clostridial bacteria. Prevention is vaccination. Normally give the first vaccination at two months and, and then a month later, and then regular every six months, they require a vaccination. And then one month prior to kidding as well. Enterotoxemia, unlike sheep and goats, uh, goats have three different forms of enterotoxemia. There is the peracute form, which is normally associated with grain and carbohydrate overload. Uh, this form is quite rare and, and it will just result in sudden death. The acute illness is due to sudden change in diet. They will start with a, a like yellow to green scour, 
which will develop into more mucus and blood and uh, you might see shreds of intestinal lining and then death. And then there's a chronic enterotoxemia as well and has economic impacts and is a notifiable disease in New South Wales with regulatory support for compulsory eradication programs in infected flocks. Uh, it's usually a challenging disease to remove and it often result to remove off your property and it often results in destocking. Sheep and goats uh, both uh, foot rot is, is the same and it can be transferred from sheep to goats and vice versa. Predis predisposing conditions include wet, muddy, badly drained pastures, overgrown hooves, overcrowded conditions, long pastures, newly introduced stock are often, um, you know, if they're not quarantined, they can be the source of bringing in that bacteria that causes foot rot. So other foot issues to consider, foot abscesses, bruised soles, wounds, white line disease, laminitis, bone fracturitis, but this form is quite rare. Blood testing is available, so it's also another uh, important, it's important if you're buying particularly dairy animals to get a goat health statement, which asks questions about CAE and um, ask about the herd testing of, for CAE or past herd testing. So just quick, I've just got a few zoonotic diseases listed here. Zoonotic diseases are diseases that go from animal to human. And I've listed only a few, but there are a plethora of diseases out there. So I just wanted to highlight the importance of personal protection and hopefully we are all, you know, we're living in the, the current climate where personal protection is paramount. So please be aware that these diseases, there are plenty of diseases out there that can go to humans and we want to be able to protect not only ourselves, but our family, friends and workers. So uh, Q fever is um, a very prevalent zoonotic disease that's caused by the bacterium Coxiella, Bernetii, and this organism can survive in the environment for a long period of time, and it's usually passed in the birthing process. Most infected goats have no clinical signs at all. Uh, there may be some that will abort or have weak kids born. But uh, clinical signs in humans include fever, headaches, pain, muscle pain, flu-like symptoms, chronic fatigue, heart and liver issues. So quite severe clinical signs seen in humans. So uh, we're fortunate enough that we have in Australia a vaccination available for humans. So protect your, be proactive and protect yourself. Cryptosporidiosis is, um, causes a watery diarrhea in um, both animals and um, and humans, salmonella also causes diarrhea and incredibly sick. Anthrax can cause cutaneous lesions and also uh, muscle soreness and even death. Leptospirosis, headaches, chills and muscle pain. But as I said, many others are available and um, always use personal protection and wash your hands. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. I've got a few links and of where you can find those articles that I spoke about. And I wanna thank you for listening. If you, if you have any um, questions about goats, please contact me or email me. And um, yeah, I, I'm always happy to help. Thanks, Kylie. I'm sure that everyone will have learned a lot from that presentation. We will have Kylie's details along with our other presenters' details available. So if anyone has any further questions about goats they think of after this webinar, they can send her an email. Now we will move on to the next part of this morning's webinar, looking at vaccinations. This will cover which animals we should vaccinate and which vaccines we should be using on our animals. My name's Christy Arnott and I'm a district veterinarian for Hunter Local Land Services based in the Singleton office. Today I want to talk to you about vaccinations and vaccinations in cattle, which, which animals should we vaccinate? Which vaccinations should we use? So we can vaccinate a number of different diseases. We can vaccinate against diseases that cause sudden death, such as 
black leg and enterotoxemia, which is also known as pulpy kidney. We can vaccinate against diseases that cause infertility and breeding problems such as leptospirosis and vibriosis. There are also vaccinations available for pink eye and there's vaccinations for three day sickness. There are other vaccinations that exist as well, but we're just going to touch on these ones today. Why do we vaccinate and how does our body respond to a vaccine? So when we give our vaccinations to animals, most vaccines require a booster vaccine or a second vaccine. Three to four weeks later, sometimes there's a slightly different, different gap in that period. This is because we need to boost the body's response to the vaccine and we need to have antibody levels. You can see on this graph that when you give the first dose of the vaccine, which is at the bottom on the zero, your antibodies start to increase and you've got your dotted line across the middle, which is your protective level of immunity. You're not protected until you get above that dotted line. And you can see the antibody level up the left hand side is the, is the response. So you give your first dose and you get a response within about one and a half to two weeks. You're starting to get your protective level of immunity. However, after three to four weeks, that protective level is decreasing. But then when we give our second dose of the vaccine around the four week mark, we can see that antibody level goes right up and it stays at a protective level. Therefore, if you're only giving that first single dose of the vaccine, you're not getting any sort of protection long term. You're only getting protection for those couple of weeks, which is why the second dose is so important for vaccinations. So what vaccines do we have? You might hear, hear talk of a five in one vaccine or a seven in one vaccine. Our five in one vaccine covers five of the common preventable clostridial diseases in cattle. So we've got enterotoxemia, which is also known as pulpy kidney. We've got black leg, tetanus, malignant edema and black disease. The seven in one covers the same five diseases as well as leptospirosis. Um, in, our, in the previous presentation by my colleague, um, Dr. Kylie Greentree, she went into some of these diseases in goats and they're very, they're very similar in the goats and the sheep. So we'll just, we'll just touch on some of them. So why would you give a seven in one instead of a five in one? Why would you want to cover for leptospirosis? Um, leptospirosis is a bacterial disease that can cause abortions in cattle. It's excreted in urine and it's also a zoonosis. So that means we can contract it from cattle. So as you can see from the diagram here, leptospirosis is, is found in contaminated water, soil and feed. But it's also um, given to us from rodents, dogs and cattle, unfortunately. And how can we get it from these animals? It can, we can get splashes and contaminates into our eyes from water or urine. We can swallow contaminated water or food, or if we've got any cuts on our hands and we come in contact with any bodily fluids or urine from these animals, we can also contract leptospirosis. So it's a pretty nasty disease. So why does it matter if we contract it? It can cause flu-like symptoms in humans. It can cause fever, headache, muscle pain, nervous symptoms. It can cause illness that can last from three days to three weeks but in 50% of patients, you can get recurring fevers, headaches, and joint pain. And these relapses can, can be very common and can last for many years. Lepto can also cause fertility problems in humans as well. And in the most serious forms, we can get meningitis, organ failure, or death. What, what signs does lepto cause in cattle? We can get a sudden drop in milk production. We can get thick, clotty, discolored milk. We can get fever, abortion, stillbirths or red water, and we can get death. But unfortunately, some cattle can show no symptoms but still shed the organism for up to 12 months, which means that you might not know your cattle have lepto. And then if you go to assist them with a the calving or you're in the dairy and you get splashed with some urine, you can contract lepto from the cattle. So high risk groups, so your farmers or anyone that comes in contact with any of the bodily fluids. So if you're ever going to assist with a calving, your cattle should be vaccinated for lepto. There isn't a human vaccine available, so we vaccinate the cattle to protect ourselves. 
So when are we going to vaccinate? Are we going to vaccinate at weaning? Are we going to vaccinate our young animals so we've got some protection prior to castrating them and dehorning them? Are we going to vaccinate our heifers prior to joining? Um, are we going to vaccinate our breeding females so that they've got some protect protection from any calving injuries? Pulpy kidney, which is enterotoxemia and black lead are most prevalent in um, cattle less than two years old. So we're gonna, we're gonna vaccinate our younger cattle. Um, black disease often occurs secondary to damage to the liver. So in liver fluke areas, all cattle are at risk. So if we've, if we've got an area with a lot of liver fluke, we need to vaccinate all our cattle for black disease. So with our five in one, we're gonna vaccinate our calves from six weeks of age, and we're going to give them two doses. And we saw in the slide, that second slide, why that second dose is so important. So the two doses are going to be four to six weeks apart. And the first dose we're going to give four to six weeks before marking. If you give your first dose at marking, you're not protecting them against the clostridial diseases they could pick up in terms of your marking and your dehorning. And tetanus is a big one there. So we want to give our first dose and then mark them when we give our second dose. If we have any unvaccinated adults, any new cattle you've brought in or ones that you haven't vaccinated previously, they also need the two doses four to six weeks apart. And then they're all going to receive a booster 12 months after the initial two doses. We also need to keep in mind that the pulp, pulpy kidney part of the vaccine only lasts for three months. So we've got to be aware for young stock and if you're changing in diet, you need to give a booster. So it might not be that you need to give a booster every three months, but you need to think about what time of year it might be most pertinent to give a booster. So if, you're, if you've just bought feed in or you're changing the pasture there on, you might go, let's give an extra pulpy kidney booster um, when we move them as a five in one, just to protect them. It's a, it's a preventable disease. So your seven in one vaccine, there's some slightly different time frames depending on which brand you use. So always follow your manufacturer's instructions, but most of them you're giving your first vaccine at six weeks of age, and you're giving your second dose at 12 weeks of age and then you're going on to annual boosters. Remember the seven in one, you're, you're still protecting your cattle, but you're protecting yourself, your family, and your, your workers. So for the seven in one, any of your unvaccinated cows and bulls, you're still gonna give your two doses, four to six weeks apart, and then you're gonna give an annual booster. You're gonna vaccinate your maiden heifers with both doses before they're mated. So you need to time it so you can get that second dose in prior to mating. And then your cows and heifers are gonna get an annual booster one month before calving. So our vaccination program for our breeders and our replacement heifers is your seven in one preferably, because these are the ones you're going to be most likely to be in contact with those bodily fluids if you assist with calvings, or you can give a five in one. But they initially need the two vaccines, four to six weeks apart, and then an annual booster. Whereas your steers or your heifers that you're gonna sell, you can just use the five in one and you can give the two vaccines four to six weeks apart and you give them their first vaccine at about three to four months of age. What about your bulls? Bulls, we're gonna use a seven in one and we're going to vaccinate them for vibriosis as well. So our seven in one, we give it the first one at three to four months of age and they're also getting a booster four to six weeks apart and then they're getting an annual booster. With your vibriosis, you're gonna give your first booster at 12 months of age and you're also gonna give um, two vaccinations, four to six weeks apart, and then annual. So why are we vaccinating for vibriosis? What's that? So it's a venereal disease of cattle caused by the bacteria Campylobacter fetus venerealis. And why do we want to vaccinate against it? Because unfortunately, vibriosis is a major cause of infertility and abortions. But the bulls often show no clinical signs, but they carry the disease and they spread it to the cows. So if you don't know that the bull is, can, is, has vibriosis and then you cover the cows, you can spread it through the herd. So you vaccinate the bulls, which is a really simple and effective way to prevent the disease. So vibriosis, you're vaccinating your bulls with two doses, four weeks apart, and then an annual booster. And you can also vaccinate your heifers a month before mating. So there's also a vaccine for pink eye. Pink eye is caused by the bacteria Moraxella bovis. With the pink eye vaccine, it's a single vaccine. So this is the one that you don't have to give a booster for. It's a one-off vaccine, but you've got to get the timing right. So you need to vaccinate before summer 
and you've got to vaccinate before the flies become too bad. It's, um, it's cost effective when you weigh up the cost of treating cattle with pink eye and the loss of production. So pink eye costs Australian beef, beef farmers over $23 million each year in lost production and treatment costs. So it's a lot of money. It's a single dose vaccine, but you've also got to have it with, um, with good fly control as well. And it can, be, it can be an awful vaccine if you inject yourself, so you've got to be very, very careful with your needles with this one. So three-day sickness, we also have a, a vaccine for three-day sickness, but again, you want to vaccinate prior to the start of summer. So this is one where we've also got two injections, but the time frame's a bit different. Instead of the others where you give the two boosters four to six weeks apart, this one, you can give it up to two weeks to six months apart. You give your initial one, but then your booster vaccination doesn't have to be given quite as quickly. Um, it's an annual vaccination. And look, it's not a cheap vaccination either, but um, we had a lot of three day this last year and it's a very, it's a very good, it's a very effective vaccine and it, it could save a lot of these cattle. So because of the cost, you treat your valuable animals, you treat your bulls, you treat some of your heavier cows, you may not treat the entire herd. So can you afford to vaccinate? Unfortunately, you often can't afford not to. A lot of these clostridial diseases and these sudden death diseases are the ones that, cost, that cause um, decreases in fertility, cost a lot of money and a lot of, and, and a lot of losses. So the best, your best insurance policy is to vaccinate. Thank you very much. All of what has been discussed so far today with bull selection, goat health and cattle vaccination is irrelevant if we don't have a good biosecurity plan in place. So now we have District Vet Dr Jane Bennett taking us through the process of how to put together a biosecurity plan and the decision making process involved in this. Jane Bennett is a vet of 35 years standing in rural practice, the last five years as a District Vet in Scone. She has an additional interest in emergency management in the agricultural and animal services functional area. Thanks Jane. Morning everyone and welcome. Just like to cover off today on some biosecurity essentials. It's a term we're getting more familiar with since COVID-19, but it applies just as importantly across farms. So I just wanted to mention some of the important factors we need to take into play, particularly with application for planning under biosecurity. We need to remember that it's the best defence against pests and diseases and it by implementing good biosecurity practices on your farm, you can build some quick and simple measures into it that'll protect your farm and your future. So what's involved in biosecurity planning? Well, A, you need to prevent the introduction of infectious diseases, pests, and a whole lot of weeds onto your property. You need to prevent the spread from an infected area to a non-infected area. And the aim of the whole episode is to make sure we maintain our food safety and the integrity of our rural industries, not only for local market access, but also for overseas. The options for biosecurity on your property, you've just got to remember that it's a tool. It's no different to any other tool you use on your farm. It's not complicated. It's quite a simple process to go through. And it's quite often looking at things you already do on your farm. It's just maintaining the records associated with it appropriately. And that can be either paper-based or there are some really good apps and computer-based systems available. One of the easiest resources to access is through Animal Health Australia, and it's the Farm Biosecurity Action Planner. And I'm going to look at some of the um, information that we gather together as part of that planning process in order to produce our final um, plan for the property. You need to complete a checklist. You need to look at organising biosecurity zones or checkpoints on the farm where you can limit the movement of risk. So you may have the house area and that's one biosecurity zone. You may have the shearing shed is another biosecurity zone. You may have the dairy and the yards associated with that. Look at those sorts of areas. Are you part of an integrity system or an accreditation scheme with an industry that you belong to? That will play into it as well. 
and the aim is to introduce management practices that decrease your risks both short term and long term. And as you go through the checklist, look at those processes and look at when you're going to be able to introduce those new practices or new systems into your farm. You need to look carefully at what you do with the following six things. Firstly, the farm inputs. You've got to remember that any new plant or animal or machinery that you bring onto a property brings risks with it. Could be disease, could be seeds, could be all sorts of options that bring a biosecurity risk onto your property. You can minimise that by looking at things like animal health declarations, by national vendor declarations and by commodity vendor declarations. Look at the equipment that comes onto your farm. Is it yours? belongs there, stays there all the time, or is it contractors that may have been onto other properties? And one of the concerns that comes into this area are things like Energy Australia vehicles that may come onto your farm having been onto other properties. Look at the feed that you're buying in. Where does it come from? How reputable are the producers? Have they got a commodity vendor deck that will enable you to know there's no toxic chemicals on board? Look at water. Is there a point of contamination? Is there leakage from farms that are above you that may leak chemicals into it? Is it coming from a reliable source? Does it have high levels of um, minerals within that system? You may be in the fortunate circumstance where you introduce beehives onto the property as part of an apiarist managed program. Are they safe? Is there an issue concerned there? Bedding goes along with feed. And finally, if you're using fertiliser, whether it's chemical or biological, does it come from a safe source? Once you've looked at the farm inputs, you need to look at the outputs. What's leaving your property? What product are you moving, it off, or moving off your property and how's it going there? Are you using contractors with vehicles to come and collect that off your property, out of your silos and take it elsewhere? Can they bring contaminants with them? If you're going to shows or sales, so livestock that you're sending to sale, are they non-diseased? Are they in good health? Is there no risk of spreading disease there? Likewise for animals going to sale, sorry, to shows. Things like animal health declarations, commodity vendor decks, and national vendor decks come into play in that system as well. You also need to look at product, tra product transport and packing how well that's managed and when you're bringing things onto the farm, is there a likelihood that you could bring disease with you? I know in the salmonella outbreak on some of the poultry properties, there's been an issue with packaging and bringing the, the bacteria onto the farm through that. Next, you need to look at people, vehicles and equipment. Some of this is the most mobile part of risk within your property. You need to look at property access. Who has access to your property? Are they registered when they come on? Do you have signage warning them that they need to register when they come onto the property? Do a risk assessment. Do people really need to have access to all parts of your property or can they just come to the house and the yard area and you can organise your risk around that narrow part of the property? Do they have good personal hygiene? Do you have hand washing, boot washing? vehicle washing facilities available, and when you do, where does the wastewater go from that, that washing area? So vehicle and equipment hygiene is really important as part of that as well. And as I mentioned, the runoff from that washing area, where does it go and how do you isolate that from the rest of your property? A good message and a good signage to have around is this come clean, go clean. You should expect visitors to your property to have cleaned off their vehicle before they come onto the property, clean themselves, wash their hands, wash their equipment. Have you got people who come and do pruning on your vineyard? Have they cleaned their, property, their equipment off effectively before they come on board? So come clean, go clean. Wash down themselves, their vehicles, their equipment before they come on. Once they're leaving, same process. Wash down, decontaminate, final rinse. Same system we're all dealing with with COVID-19 at the moment. Next, we need to look at individual production practices. So how do we manage plant and animal waste on our property? 
Is it managed effectively? Does it leave high risk? Where is our washdown zone from the dairy going to? Do we risk spreading disease from those animals onto high risk um, livestock like our calves? Are we minimising those impacts? Look at our feed and water storage. How do we do it? Where is it managed? Do we make sure that we clean out silos between loads? That sort of, uh, <coughs> sorry, that sort of risk management. With our livestock, do we vaccinate for all the endemic diseases in our area to make sure we're not risking spread or risking disease outbreaks? Things like five in one, leptospirosis. If we need to, pestivirus. Those sorts of vaccines, are we doing them for the animals in the right way at the right time? It's all very well good to vaccinate, but we need to make sure we're following the correct regime. Chemical use, and by chemicals, I mean not only chemicals for spraying weeds, but also chemicals that we use on animals. So medications, antibiotics, are we using them as they should be used? Are we making sure that we're looking at their withholding periods or export slaughter intervals? Are we looking at drenches? Are we making sure we're not getting resistance problems for the parasites on our property? We need to monitor and look at surveillance programs for those. We also need to look at our fencing. Is it secure? Do we stop our livestock from wandering between properties and therefore risk things like vibriosis, pestivirus coming onto our property or spreading it to other properties around the area? All of those things looking hygienic or have we got great weed banks sitting around our cattle yards or our quarantine paddocks when livestock first come onto the property? We need to monitor where we fed livestock from hay that's or other feed that's been bought on board so that we can make sure if we've got a new weed incursion, we can get rid of it pretty quickly. The other one that you need to be aware of is this term called volunteer plants. So crop plants that have escaped from the cultivated area and are in laneways or other paddocks on the property. They can remain as a reservoir for pests and once you get a new crop in, those pests will go back to that crop. So you need to monitor and provide surveillance for those. The other important one to remember in the ferals, pests and weeds is when we have natural disasters, so fires or floods. Every time we have one of these events, there is a huge influx of weeds and other pest animals after the event. We're trying to feed with whatever feed we can find and bring it in from outside areas, so we need to monitor that. And we also get animals that are coming in to feed off that feed that wouldn't normally be part of our production cycle. So pigs will come out of wilderness or national park areas and come onto properties and feed there, bringing their pests with them. And finally, we need to look at training, planning and recording. You need to gather that information that we've talked about, put it into a biosecurity plan. And there are some really good resources around to develop that plan once we've looked at the checklist. We need to revisit it regularly. There is no point in having a plan on day one and not looking at it for five years. You need to revisit every six months, every 12 months at absolute minimum to make sure, yes, I have instituted that new program. Yes, our vaccination regime is working. Yes, our surveillance and monitoring for drug drench resistance is working because we're doing the testing that we've said we'd do on our biosecurity plan. It's also really important to keep records and the level of record keeping can vary. If you're on a small property where you carry under 100 livestock, it may be perfectly adequate to keep that record in your farm diary. That's absolutely fine and perfectly acceptable. However, if you've got much larger numbers of livestock and a bigger business, you need to have a visitor record. You need to have treatment records, including things like batch numbers on those treatments. You need to keep record of the commodity vendor decks that you've put out, the national vendor decks you've put out, and the ones that you've acquired when you've bought in feed and livestock. You need to make sure you train your staff. 
not only in important things like chemicals, which is a requirement to be able to purchase them, but also in biosecurity and surveillance. Good hygiene is part of the number one things in biosecurity training. Do they wash their gear before they come on farm? Do they wash their hands while they're on farm? Do they wash it leaving the property? Do they leave boots behind on the property so that they can take clean stuff home and they're not using boots from home when they come onto your property? Can all be an important part of that biosecurity training. With chemicals, the ability to keep records, know and understand how to manage them effectively is really important and training in that takes place on a routine basis. And finally, surveillance. It's really, really important to monitor what's happening on the property. Keep an eye on livestock. Make sure you're checking them on a regular basis. Likewise with crops, you need to take a walk through the crop, monitor whether they've got pest incursions, whether they need chemical sprays, whether they've got mildew taking place. All those sorts of things are important. And without actually doing some surveillance and monitoring and training people in what to look for, everybody is at a loss. And finally, it is absolutely paramount that you report issues. Part of the Biosecurity Act is that it's an obligation to report suspect weeds, pests and diseases of plants and animals. One of the really common advertising campaigns that we use for animal surveillance is look, check, ask a vet. Really, really simple. Same applies for weeds, same applies for pest animals, same applies for any plant diseases that you notice. Ask the question. We're there to support you and your industry as much as possible. There's two important numbers on the screen there, both for the exotic plant pest hotline and the emergency animal disease watch hotline. Take a record of them, keep them on hand, and remember, you can always call Hunter Local Land Services to give you assistance. Thank you, Jane. Having a biosecurity plan and understanding the steps involved is paramount to reduce the risk of transmission of infectious diseases, invasive pests or weeds. We need to prevent the spread between farms, but also protect Australia from diseases and weeds that occur overseas. Thank you to all our presenters today for illustrating some of the decision-making processes that you will go through on your properties. It can make such a difference to your livestock and your operation by understanding what your options are and knowing what decisions need to be made. Now, I know that we have gone a little over time already, so we'll just answer one of the questions that have come through during the presentation. For the other questions, we will email you with a response and also put the responses up on our Facebook page. A question has come through about goats, so I'll direct this one to Kylie. And the question is, how often should I be drenching my goats? Thanks, Kylie. Thanks, Christy. That's a great question because I, I do get asked that question quite a lot. A lot of people just regularly drench their goats, you know, once a month or whatever program they've got. So. Um, I don't recommend that you drench regularly. I, I recommend that you only drench those that actually need to be drenched. So you want to incorporate other integrated parasite management uh, tools into your management. So things like cross-grazing other species. So you can use horses to come in after, after the goats have been in the paddock and they can vacuum up your paddocks, get vacuum up all those larvae out of your paddocks. So that can work quite well. Then you can shut those paddocks up, let the pasture grow to, to a good height, greater than 10 centimetres. So because goats are browsers, they eat from the top of the blades of grass. And so then they're not having that access to the larvae as much. So the longer the pasture, the better. If you can incorporate browse into their diet, that's also really beneficial because not only are they browsers, but also they're going to be eating with their heads up and also then they have um, less access to the larvae in the paddocks. And also the tannins in that, um, in that browse can also decrease the faecal egg count of the worms that are in the intestinal system. So um, also it's very a good idea to do regular faecal egg counts 
and um, if you have uh, a FAMARCHA card to do FAMARCHA scoring on a regular basis. So depending on the time of year, uh, then uh, you would do that like every few weeks, checking the, the uh, eye colour with your FAMARCHA card and, um, and working out which ones need to be drenched and which ones don't need to be drenched. Um, so if you've got white, particular goats that are causing problems all the time and contaminating your paddocks, then they're the, unfortunately, they're the ones that need to be culled from your, from your property because 20% of your goats are probably causing 80% of your problems. So um, some people will do feedlotting if, um, if you know, drenches are not working on their property and, um, and they just can't get on top of the worm. So they will have, they might um, just, yeah, do feedlotting so the, uh, um, the feed troughs are on the outside of the fence and there's no access to pasture. That's also, that works very well. And, uh, and some people will delay grazing. So the larvae that is on the pasture, um, it likes moisture. So as the, um, as the moisture deep goes down the blade of grass, like in the morning, then um, the, in the, if the pasture height is quite high, then they will um, have less access to the larvae as well. So um, drenching, uh, goats metabolise drenches quite a lot faster than sheep, so often they will require a different dose rate. So this is, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, you need to get a prescription from your veterinarian on the correct dose rate and recommended withholding period because um, a lot of drenches are not registered for goats and so they, um, they, they need to have that prescription. And um, yeah, so that's kind of that question in a small nutshell. And, um, but if you need any more information, uh, then please send me an email. So thanks, Christy. Thanks, Kylie. Well, that concludes our fourth and final webinar in this decision-making series. We hope you enjoyed them and found, found them useful. If you have missed any of the webinars or want to watch them again, we will be making the recordings of each webinar available. All registered participants will also receive a resource toolkit in the post this month. This will include a USB with all the recorded presentations, fact sheets and links to online resources referred to in the presentations. To register for this USB kit, please visit the Hunter LLS website event page for Hunter Livestock Forum 2020 and complete the online form.